Hello, uh, this is Jerry Baker. I'm editor at large with the uh, Wall Street Journal. Thank you very much indeed for joining us for this uh, Horasis uh, plenary session on the global economic outlook. Um, we've got a terrific panel um, for you uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, and we're going to talk about the immediate outlook for the economy, um, but also look at some of the longer term trends uh, in the US and the global economy. Um, the panel, uh, you will uh, know, I'm sure we have uh, three, we uh, have three rather than four, but Andreas Fibig is the Chairman CEO of International Flavors and Fragrances. Thank you very much for being here, Andreas. He joins us from Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, Hank McKinnell, former Chairman uh, of, of Moody's and of course, uh, formerly of Pfizer. Um, so we will have some very interesting um, conversations uh, about the post-pandemic world as, that, as we are living in it. And Jane Werwin is founder of Dermalogica. She's uh, joining us from LA. And I should say, Hank is joining us from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So thanks all of you for, for being here. And thank you, um, thank you to the panel and thank you to all the guests. I want to start off, um, again, obviously, we're going to talk about the, the longer term outlook for the economy. And as we emerge, we hope we're emerging from the COVID pandemic and how the economy is changing and what the challenges and opportunities are in that economy. But obviously, I want to start with a very, with a very topical, very tragic uh, and very distressing uh, events going on in Europe and um, talk about those for a little bit and about how, they, how, how it's going to affect the, uh, the economic outlook. Um, clearly, uh, what's going on in Ukraine is first and foremost a humanitarian catastrophe and a geopolitical catastrophe. And if I may say so, I think, uh, speaking personally, uh, also a, a, a crime against humanity. But um, it also will have, um, may have serious economic implications um, in Europe, particularly the Russian economy is essentially being cordoned off from the world in, in large part by the sanctions. It's going to devastate the uh, Ukrainian economy and indeed some other economies, perhaps in Eastern Europe. And of course, the implications of it, we've seen obviously dramatically increased geopolitical uncertainty, higher energy prices, sharply higher energy prices, oil prices going above $100 a barrel, um, fueling the concerns that everybody had already had about inflation. Um, and I think there are also some other interesting long-term questions to ask about it, about the, uh, the way in which the global economy is, uh, integrates and the way in which economies work together. We see these dramatic sanctions that are being imposed, how that may affect the countries themselves, not only, not only Russia, of course, but the extent to which we may get blowback um, on the countries imposing the sanctions and what implications that may have. So um, if I may, Hank, let me start with you just on this very specific question, just a quick, your quick assessment. Um, what's your sense as you look now, as I say, in this period, this you know unprecedented period, really, in the last forty years of a glow of a, of a major conflict in Europe, um, and what implications that may have uh, for the for the for the global economic uh, for global economic prospect? Well, what we're calling sanctions, uh, not too long ago, used to be called a trade war. And just as shooting wars tend to spin out of control and have unintended consequences, as tragically we're seeing in the Ukraine, uh, trade wars tend to do the same thing. So impact on energy is an obvious one, uh, but it goes much further than that. Uh, the Ukraine has been called the breadbasket of Europe. So I think we should be looking at wheat supply and wheat prices. Uh, there's a number of uh, uh, items that are sourced from Russia, fertilizer being a big one. Uh, farmers in the United States will be planting crops very soon, and they need enormous amounts of fertilizer to add to those fields. Uh, and there's some more esoteric things, cotton and palladium and rare earths, which are in gases, which are very essential to chip production. So I don't think we know the consequences uh, of the Ukraine invasion, but we know it's not going to be good either for Ukraine or economic prospects around the world. Jane, uh, your thoughts on, on what's going on there? You're, you know, very much, a, you know, your consumer business, your global business. I know you have a lot of a business in, uh, you have business in Europe. What, mm -hmm. What's your, if you look at this, it's obviously very hard to, to know what's going to happen, how long this is going to go on, and uh, as Hank says, what the impact of the sanctions may be, but what's your sense as you, as you as you look out at this, um, at this sort of terrible tragedy unfolding there and, and what the implications may be? Well, Jerry, as you know, my background is in the salon industry and, uh, and I'm also always very focused on skill set training and on apprenticeships. 
And if you look at the example of Germany, when they took in a million uh, refugees from Syria, uh, pretty much every one of them was placed into either skilled work or apprenticeships where they could learn a skill. We've got 20 million jobs open in America for skilled workers that we can't fill. So my prayer is that a great many of the people who are going to find themselves uprooted from Ukraine will have skill sets, or at least we're going to countries that can afford them apprenticeships to retrain into a job that they can start working immediately. Because it's only with that kind of, of education can you get a job pretty much straight away. I know in, in California, the first two refugees that came from Syria happened to be halal butchers, and they were placed in, in work immediately in Stockton, California. So it may sound a bit nitty gritty, but how you're going to feed your family and how you're going to earn a wage and, and what job you can create is going to be critical to the people leaving Ukraine, unfortunately. Thanks, Jane. And, and Andreas, your, your thoughts on um, what we, you know, again, trying to peer through the fog of uncertainty, what this, uh, what this might mean? Yeah, actually, what we have seen in the last two years of the pandemic, our supply chains were already very much under stress and, and we have seen delays to get raw materials and come up with, with products for our, our customers. And I believe now through the Ukraine, that will even worsen. And we have seen also a, a great inflation on, on energy costs in general, but in particular in Europe. And for every company which has a significant European footprint, that will be actually quite uh, quite of a significant burden because I don't expect that this will go backwards. So despite the, the fact that we have in, in many of our businesses really good demand, very strong demand, the inflationary pressures are really, really high. And also to satisfy our customers to get all the things. And it just uh, we talked, uh, Hank talked about energy costs and wheat, but uh, like sunflower oil, for example, comes out of Ukraine as well, which is one of the ingredients which is important for, for some of our customers. So it, it has multiple, uh, uh, um, let's say, implications for us and for the for the business. So inflation is actually at the moment and supply disruption my, my biggest concern. And then just one thing, if you look at the flight routes, nobody can fly over Ukraine, obviously, but Russia as well. That right. means delays and, and costs are going up for air freight as well again. Right. Yes, indeed. And with the uh, sanctions on the uh, oligarchs, it's not going to be good for the uh, expensive, the luxury yacht and private jet business, uh, I think, and probably um, London real estate and other places, too. Uh, I'm delighted to say we've been joined. Uh, Marco Antonio Del Prete. Thank you very much indeed, Marco. I know you were. Thanks very much. I'm glad you were glad you were able to join us. Sorry, we started just uh, just just, okay. without, just before. No. I know you're, you're, you're very much your sustainable development is your, um, you know, is very much is, is, is your focus and, you know, the focus of your career uh, we, we just started off as you can probably tell we just, I just start uh, going with an opening round of questions about the implications of this terrible tragedy and this terrible crime unfolding in Ukraine and I, I just wondered do you have any any thoughts about whether I mean long term medium term what it may mean in terms of energy dependence energy and sustainability or what indeed it may mean for the for the global economy yes and, and I thank you very much for, for the for this uh, opportunity to, to talk with you and uh, and I'm, please receive my apologies for for uh, joining joining a little bit late. Yes, and it's well, it's it's a tragedy that as, as you as you stated very well, and more more about uh, economic uh, impact is is the families and all the persons that are are are, are suffering from from this uh, this tragedy. But uh, talking about the economy, well, you know, Mexico Mexico is uh, I, I'm I'm the secretary of sustainable development in. In Querétaro, Mexico, it's a, it's a central state in, in Mexico, and, and uh, well, we, we depend a lot of, of, of foreign trade, foreign trade in, in from from Europe. Uh, Querétaro, uh, Querétaro's economy is based in in manufacturing, automotive manufacturing, and aerospace manufacturing, and we depend a lot of, of, of supplies and, and raw materials from from abroad. That uh, we hopefully we ho we're hoping that this uh, this this tragedy uh, doesn't uh, last so so long because. Our, our uh, chains, value chains, will be affected dramatically. Could be affected dramatically because of of, of this of this uh, uh, shortage of of, of, of supply. Uh, but our our first thought is always with the families and the persons who are suffering from from this this uh, uh, unfair war. Of course, yes. Thank you for that. Um, so let, let's turn to the the, the the broader economic picture. 
Um, almost exactly two years uh, since the start of the pandemic, since the biggest disruption really to the global economy that we've seen in at least 50 years, I think. Um, it's been an extraordinary time. Much of the world, you can say, cautiously, optimistically, warily, does seem to be emerging now, particularly North America, Europe, uh, to, to, to a large extent, um, seems to be emerging. There will clearly be more variants. We, we understand that, and there might be more um, periods in which the, we, we have to reintroduce restrictive measures. But but as it seems, the, 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 the uh, economies are emerging. We've just had in the United States today, uh, those of you who have been watching uh, will have seen very, very strong, very good employment figures uh, published by the Labor Department. The uh, U.S. economy added almost 700,000 jobs in February. Uh, it's added over 7 million jobs over the last uh, year alone. Uh, unemployment rate is back down to 3.8 percent, which is almost where it was before the pandemic. Output is back above the level it was before the pandemic. So the U.S., you know, I think probably is leading the world here in terms of emerging from the pandemic. But of course, the and we'll go on and talk about this, the, the big worry and the big threat that comes with that is this surge in inflation that we've seen. But let me start. Let me. So let me again go back to Hank. Um, where do you think we are? Do you think that um, we'll talk about America, but also the rest of the world? Do you think that um, we can now expect this? Um, continue, we, we, we're set fair for this continued economic recovery with strong job growth, falling, in, uh, falling, in, falling unemployment and rising wages. Are we, are we essentially out of the woods? Well, my photo on the screen here seems to have me in the dark. Uh, I'm not sure if that's my camera or the fact that we're talking about economic forecast. <laughs> we can, I can say, well, I, I suppose I can tell, and I think everybody else can probably say the same. We can see you very clearly. Well, your face is luminous. Yogi <laughs> Vero was famous for saying that uh, forecasts are particularly difficult, particularly when they apply to the future. So <laughs> that's where we find ourselves. Uh, the economic forecasts for the U.S. are actually remarkably strong. Uh, growth from 5.7% last year down to 4% this year, which is still very, very good. Uh, inflation from 7.5% last year, which I think is about a 40-year high, down to 3.5%. Uh, I would only say that I worked for many years, many, many years, with a head of manufacturing who always said, the one thing we know about forecasts is they're wrong. And I, I think that's certainly true here. Uh, I would say there's three reasons. One is Ukraine and all the issues we've already discussed. Uh, secondly is the virus. Uh, it's a basic role of microbiology that if a virus or a bacteria is replicating, it's mutating. Now, 99.99% of those mutations are harmless and irrelevant, but 0.01% of a million new infections a day is something we shouldn't forget we could find ourselves back to square one if a resistant mutation was to appear. So that's actually second off my list. The other one that intrigues me is uh, the limits of monetary policy. The consensus forecasts seem to uh, reflect the belief that uh, uh, monetary policy, the Fed and others around the world will deal with this. They'll manage this perfectly. Uh, my favorite definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. And I think the Fed can do something about the too much money part of that equation. But I don't think they can do much about the too few goods, particularly if it's supply chain disruption and shortages and trade embargoes that are affecting supply. So I think the current forecasts are blatantly optimistic, uh, not cautiously optimistic. And I don't I think at the end of next year, we'll look back and know why they were wrong. But like my head of manufacturing, I know they're wrong. Jane, let me ask you, you, you remind us um, at the start that your, your, your business, you know, a, lot of, a lot of your business, I think, is south salons. Mm -hmm. That's obviously a part of the economy service, part of the economy that has been incredibly hard hit in the last two years. But are you now confident that um, we're seeing, um, you know, a significant recovery in, well, in your businesses, but also in, in the wider sort of service sector. Yeah, I am. And I'm actually, I am an optimist. I will say that uh, in our industry, because it's not just a service business, but also, and this may sound a little esoteric, but we're in the business of human connection. 
And it's something that people have been missing, whether it's the restaurant industry, whether it's the salon industry, the service industry, um, no one is going to be replaced in our industry or very few by artificial intelligence. We literally deliver human touch and we've seen growth in our industry. In fact, our numbers were up into well high in the double digits over 2019 last year, which we were surprised at. Mm. But one of the things that we've seen is that in our category of, of services, and especially when it's with human connection, we're seeing a really extraordinary growth. And uh, I think that uh, we've probably all read in the, in the financial papers, Unilever has made no a clear argument, uh, Alan Jopas, CEO, of moving out of, of a great many of the food lines and ice cream and uh, doubling down on prestige beauty, which I think was an unexpected move, but it's one that a lot of the big multinationals are following. We've had 55 million new uh, business applications in the last year, a great many of them in the salon industry, up 55% from 2019. And one of the segments that's growing particularly fast is that of women. Women are opening businesses at far rapid rates than, than men, and especially black women. Black women are opening their own businesses uh, nine times more than any other group. So we're very optimistic about growth in our industry, especially in the service segment, not just the product segment. And uh, I will also say that as entrepreneurs, you've, you kind of have to figure out how you're going to turn it around, how you're going to start your business up again, how you're going to reinvent your business, yeah. and how you're going to find those consumers that are looking for you. Can I just follow up quickly, Jane, before going on to the others? Um, it's interesting you say, you know, you're in the, the human, the sort of human interaction, the human engagement business as much as anything. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's something that here we are. Look, here we are. We're on Zoom or well, not Zoom. Sorry, we're on um uh, we're, we're, on, we're on another software, but we're using this you know, technology that we've all got so used to using in the last two years. And there is a view, I think, that you know, it's, it, it, this is, the world has changed permanently, that actually people will be doing more and more of this and less and less of the human interaction. I, I'm certainly not enthusiastic about that, if that's true, because I don't know if I speak for most people sort of had enough of these uh, video, video calls. But you, do you think that... You know, once we're fully through the pandemic, that 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 we will, people will re-engage, humans will re-engage again with each other. I think they already are. I mean, we we will see for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So I think we're going to see explosion in in virtual and digital. We are looking at a lot of uh, focus on that. We've put all of our education onto digital, and we're teaching virtually around the world now. We teach in 106 countries, so technology has allowed us to do that. But at the same time, we're seeing this rapidly uh, increasing demand for human connection. So once you spent a whole day on Zoom or any of these platforms, you know, you're pretty exhausted. Mm. But if you've spent that whole day in a room with people actually physically in the same room, that collaboration is inspiring and you leave the room feeling invigorated. And so I think we're going to have a balance of the two. And I think that we're going to have plenty on Zoom that can be on Zoom and it's pretty transactional. And then the things that are highly creative and collaborative, we're going to have a blend, a hybrid of uh, digital, virtual and in person. Andreas, I know your business, you supply a lot of um... Uh, a lot of products for consumer for, for consumer consumer products and, and others. Um, obviously, they've been. That's, I, I'm guessing that's been a pretty strong. You know, people have. The, you know, we, everybody's marked on the contrast between goods and services in the economy over the last two years. How do you see things now? It is uh, actually very very strong. What we see and, and look, our flavors go basically in every every yogurt and and, and other ap application of our fragrances into detergent and and and, and puffers. And uh, what we see is still a strong demand. We were always asking ourselves, what is inventory building of our customers? But we can't see inventory building right now. So it's, it's real demand. It looks like that the consumers are really willing to send. And we do active cosmetics, peptides as well. So we see in the cosmetic industry that this is, 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 a, is, is a big area as well. What concerns me is despite the inflation and, and the Ukraine and supply chain we discussed is a labor shortage. And I give you, give you an example. Uh, we have around the world around about 150 manufacturing plants. And right now in the US and, and Western Europe, we are, uh, we are paying sign-on bonuses for factory workers. Look, I'm, I'm for 40 years in the industry. I've never seen this. 
and uh, not talking about all the truck drivers which are missing in in the US where we can't get all our our goods to our our customers. So all in all, I'm optimistic on the demand side, and I think even the consumers can uh, can can face uh, the, uh, the the price increases through inflation. But the labor shortages and the supply issues we are having that looks like that is not going away so 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 quickly. So let's hope that uh, we find all the way. And I said it to my head of manufacturing: we have to automatize and robotize as much as we can because maybe even in the future people don't want to work in a factory any longer. They want to do something 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 else. So I think we all as as, as, as corporations, we have to adapt to the new reality, which is not just the crisis and COVID, but the general sh- shift in society, what people want to want to do. And, and and you mentioned that in the Great Resignation, I think, Jane, mm-hmm. we see people are retiring earlier than, than expected and people are fatigued from, from, from the crisis and the pandemic. And we have to find how can we fill the gaps in a very smart way. So that's what I see. Demand very strong, more the labor shortages in the supply chain which is my, my, my worry and my concern. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You're absolutely right. And also, I think, you know, we've, we've gone through an industrial revolution. It's much like, you know, the previous of the last two centuries ago, people came yeah. off the land and went into factories, and now they want to come out the factories and go into their own businesses. Yeah. And yeah. skilled labor is at a high shortage. And then on top of it, I think we all try to solidify and build our supply chains much more robust. I'll give you an example. Out of the early stages of the pandemic, we get a lot of our raw materials or let's say first materials, chemicals from China and from India. All of a sudden, the pandemic, the Indian uh, um, uh, ports were all closed. We couldn't get anything. So you better have a plan B and nowadays probably even a plan C to make sure that that, that you have your supply chains robust. And and maybe, and it's a lot of talk, but but that's what we are doing. We are, we are bringing, repatriating some of the manufacturing bases to uh, to Europe or to the U.S. to make sure that we are more independent from from some of the Far East countries. Yes, this uh, the, the remigration that uh, Jane is talking about from cities to the to the land is a striking feature. Probably very helpful for real estate prices in places like Jackson Hole, I expect. Um, but anyway, um, I, uh, Marco, I wanted to ask you. We've spoken a lot about the U.S., particularly and to some extent Europe. How do things look from uh, from where you are in Mexico? What uh, how is the economy? How, how is the economy emerging? Well, uh, as, as you know, Mexico has been suffering uh, as, as well as all the all the world, but Mexico specifically with these uh, high rates in, in, in deaths because of, of COVID. But and one thing that uh, Querétaro, it's a state with, uh, where I can talk about, we're working a lot in, in just not recovering from, from the pandemic. Fortunately, the, the rate of, 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 of illness is, is uh, getting, getting uh, lower. And our economy is recuperating. In terms of jobs, we have almost recuperated what uh, the jobs we already had and prior to the pandemic. And, and uh, one thing that is very clear for us is that the, the health is very frail. And, and more than that, it's that we only have one, one, one planet. We live on the same planet. And, and we are uh, uh, um, uh, taking a, a crusade uh, towards a, a circular economy. In terms of we have to re- uh, return to the, to the planet uh, what, what the planet has, has given us. And on those those terms, we're trying to to, to generate new new economic uh, roads, new economic paths, in terms of uh, not just uh, favoring our environment, but creating new new sources uh, for jobs and production. And and that that the way uh, that will be a way in, in terms of not just relying on manufacturing, not just relying on raw materials, because the shortage will be uh, in, inevitably in in the, in the near future. And if, in specifically, if we keep uh, 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 extracting and producing at the rate we are extracting and producing right now, we will not have any any more uh, raw materials to to do that. So, so here in in Querétaro, we're we're trying to to look forward uh, outside from the bo- box, not just in in, in generating uh, uh, economic value to our people, but just uh, but thinking on the companies to be uh, profitable for them. But furthermore, to be uh, uh, environmentally uh, friendly. By, by this means, we are trying to uh, generate new, as I was telling, new, new, new economy uh, path, pathways. And, 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 but keeping our, our strengths in, 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 in terms of, of economic uh, 
uh, developments such as manufacturing in, in many, many other uh, uh, brands such as automotive and aerospace but in which we are uh, leaders uh, nationwide in, in Mexico, but and also trying to get more into the knowledge economy to rely more on knowledge than, than, on, than on physical work and, and I insist in, in, in raw materials. That's why we are uh, 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 betting, betting hard in, in terms of, of deep tech, betting hard in terms of data centers, betting hard in terms of this uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution that we are facing. And, and, and with that, uh, we hope to, uh, to, to regain the, our, our economic growth that we are, we are uh, fortunately for Querétaro, we're not just generating the same uh, amount of jobs, we are just also generating the same amount of, of our gross uh, domestic product. It's, it's uh, regaining the pre-pandemic yeah. uh, levels. But we have to think uh, in, in, in not just uh, this uh, uh, post-pandemic, we have to think the, the, the long term because the world will not be the same after after these these uh, events. Thanks, Marco. Let, let's talk. We touched on this already a little bit, but let's talk in more detail about it, which is the big concern I think many people have, which is inflation. Uh, it's a concern for businesses, it's a concern for workers as inflation that strips their wages at the moment. And of course, it's a concern for policymakers. We've seen way as uh, as Hank said, uh, prices are rising in the U.S. at the fastest, or um, Jane, I think, said the fa fastest rise in 40 years. Uh, Europe is seeing similar, not quite as strong, but similar surges in inflation. Uh, we've got this additional complication now of sharply higher energy prices, um, and that doesn't seem to be going away. Hank, um, you know, again, in your remarks, your optimistic remarks about the economy, you said, you know, inflation is expected to come down. But we do have a situation here where, again, consumer prices seven and a half percent in the in the U.S. at the moment. Um, producer prices rising at an even faster rate than that. We do expect some of these bottlenecks that has produced that to to go away. But wage pressure is still strong. The month the Federal Reserve is still it's going to start raising interest rates. Everybody expects later this month, but it's still we have interest rates in the U.S. that are still basically zero. I I, I looked that the last time inflation in the U.S. was as high as it is now. It was 1982. And the federal funds rate, the interest rate, the policy interest rate back then was 10 and a half percent. Now the policy interest rate is basically zero, it's a quarter of a percent. So we've got to expect, presumably, much sharper um, rise in interest rates. We're going to see a tightening of monetary policy. I'm just wondering, how does the economy, to you first, how does the economy navigate this, um, this inflationary, this in, this, this, these inflationary risks? Well, my guess is not very well. Uh, and the reason is that inflation feeds inflation, that as prices go up, inflationary expectations increase, producers are facing higher costs. There's a very bad cycle here that's very hard to break. Historically, these cycles have been broken by sharply higher interest rate, which basically knocks the economy on the head. Now, the assumption seems to be that the policymakers will navigate this just fine. They'll manage it well. Uh, but there are black swan events, kind of tail events here, which are serious but unlikely. Uh, Ukraine would have been in that bucket. Uh, that obviously happened tragically. Uh, the other one I worry about that I think might undo the policymakers is, and I'll talk about the virus because I know more about viruses than I do about the economy, frankly. Uh, China has managed the uh, COVID response probably as well as anybody. They did it by isolation. They did it by vaccination of their population with locally produced vaccines. Uh, the problem is isolation doesn't work forever. And we don't know much about these vaccines that were, were, were used. There was very little published. We know very little about the duration of protection. Hong Kong is an interesting example. Hong Kong had zero cases for months and months. Isolation really worked. This week, they're running 35,000 new cases a day. If that's a precursor for what might happen in China, we are going to have massive disruption in supply chain. The Fed will, be, will feel compelled to respond to the economic implications of that unwilling to raise rates as aggressively as they should to protect the economy because that's their other their other mandate to protect employment. Um, and I think it's going to be a very difficult year. That's a very good point, uh, Hank. Andreas, um, on inflation, uh, you've already mentioned the 
uh, labor markets being so tight and um, the supply of labor being extremely tight and that's pushing up wages. Do you, are you seeing cost pressures across the board and is that requiring you to raise your own price? Are we, are we, are we in this risk now of a cost um, price spi- a cost and price price spiral? I, I would say we are because uh, we have seen it actually last year already with raw materials, which went up quite significantly. Then the logistic costs went up. And it was basically driven, uh, air freight went up because during the pandemic there were less airplanes uh, in the air and basically less less capacity. Um, we have seen it uh, then on the energy cost, in particular in, in the fourth quarter. And now I would say what many businesses probably just getting an idea is about wage inflation. Because yeah. everybody has done the budget last year and said, okay, let's let's say it's 4% on a global base, but we want to raise our wages. Now we are already rethinking, is that enough in, in some of the geographies like the US? We have an inflation rate of, uh, of, of 6, uh, 6%. Even the core inflation is above 5%. And if we do the next step, that means another price increase for our customers, which goes into the Unilevers and PepsiCo's of the world, who will then ask for price increases with the consumers. So I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic on this one as well, because the inflation will drive us certainly up over the course of the year. And the question is really, will the demand stay strong as it is right now? Or will the consumer some point in time say, I can't do it any, any longer? I've seen, look, I'm I'm German American, and and when you talk to people who have not a big income in Germany right now, and they're sitting in their homes and they have to pay for the gas prices, mm. it's it's chilling, yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah. Jane, uh, you seeing similar cost pressures in your business? You know, Leonard Lauder once famously said that our industry was inflation proof. I'm not sure that that's <laughs> that's completely accurate. But what I will say is that I think that, um, you know, we've, we're seeing this separation. We're losing our, our sort of mis- our middle piece when we have people who are struggling strongly and people who are not struggling as much. I will say that in our small business sectors, um, they've seen at least a 20 percent increase in the cost of supplies and services. And in order to keep costs down, a lot of small businesses are not hiring. They're still recovering from COVID restrictions and perhaps a repayment on rent and a repayment on some of the loans they took out. However, I, you know, I think of when I emigrated here in 1982, when inflation was very high and California had a 10.4% unemployment rate. And, uh, and yes, interest rates were up above, above 10%. And I remember hearing uh, President Bill Clinton speaking about when he came in as president some eight, ten years later, saying that what he managed to benefit from was this enormous entrepreneurship bubble that was happening in Silicon Valley and in California. And we sensed that when we came here, there was something bubbling underneath that none of us knew exactly how it was going to happen and what was going to happen. But that literally took off like a rocket. And and President Clinton said, you know, sort of saved the economy during his his terms. Now, I don't know if we have another tech bubble coming, but I do. I'm an optimist and I do believe that there will be in any industrial revolution. We're also going through a political and economic and a human uh, revolution. I believe that there will be enormous capacity for new growth in segments that we haven't even thought of. Uh, thank you, Jane. And Marco, um, you know, this is a big preoccupation in the U.S. inflation. How is it seen in Mexico? Well, uh, as, as you know, Mexico, it's an emerging country with a lot of challenges. And I believe inflation inflation for uh, for a country like Mexico is is the most most unfair of the taxes because it it, it impacts in the, in the in the people who has less and mexico with 40% of, of of the population living in extreme poverty it's it's a it's a very very big concern for for us uh, it, we are not exempt of what is happening in 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 other world but what we have we have to focus is in 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 uh, 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 advancing in in terms of of uh, job creation in terms of, of raising the the, um, the salary income uh, line for for the people, because not just uh, uh, in in terms of of, of a real of real uh, wage, uh, Mexico Mexico insists it's, it's suffering but of, of many many uh, public policies that are not nor not uh, allowing this the, the people who are in, in extreme poverty to 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 raise their their income uh, line. 
but uh, it's it's a great challenge. But in Querétaro, we're we're facing it, uh, trying to promote a competitiveness, trying to promote job creation, and and and, and exploiting the, the the human potential by by, by uh, attracting new new projects for for investment. It's it's complicated for us, but uh, we have we have to to take the the, the best part of it. Thank you, uh, Marco. I, we have a few minutes left, and in, in that time, I want to try and explore um, some of the kind of longer-term uh, implications of COVID or of, of the of the pandemic and how it's changing our world, our economy for the longer term, not just in terms of the short-term economic performances. And I want to go around and get your sense about that. Let me start, and and, and Andreas, I'll I'll start with you. You've already mentioned, um, you know, changes to the way in which people work um, and the effect that that's having on the labour market. Um, we've all got used to, 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 to using technology in interesting new ways. It does seem that a lot of the trends that were in place before the pandemic have been accelerated by the pandemic yes. in terms of um, technology in particular. What's your how, how dram- pandemics through history have had a pretty dramatic effect on the way societies work? What's your what, 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 what are your expectations about how this what the, the long term imprint of, of this? Yeah. pandemic? No, Jerry, I, I think it's a great, great question. I, I see actually three implications from, from our, or my point of view. First of all, companies are really looking, how could we uh, become more self-reliant? How can we solidify our supply chains? And that will have, uh, I think, massive changes in how we supply our, our different customers uh, ahead of us. That's number one. Number two, I mentioned automatization. I think we will see more drive to it because... People are just want to do more added value work instead of being in a, in a factory or a truck driver. And then in general, I, I, I believe it has changed the way we interact. I, I'm somebody who likes to work with people to be creative and come up with good solutions. But even I have seen over the last two years that doing meetings via Zoom, even running board meetings. Look, we integrated, we, we did a big merger. We bought the nutrition bioscience division from DuPont. We integrated during the uh, uh, pandemic 11,000 new colleagues, and most of them are virtually. I would say, did it go well? I think much better than I thought, uh, despite the fact that we couldn't talk to these people. So having said all of that, I believe the future of work looks differently than than what we have seen in the, in the past. I don't think that people will go back full time into offices. They will come back, but we have to find the right equilibrium. Even in R and D facilities, we have a brand new R and D facility in Leiden in Holland, where the researchers can can basically start their experiments in the labs from their homes, mm-hmm. and then just a technician is doing some changes, and then they get the results which is good and bad at the same time. The good thing is you can do it and, 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 and you can get results. The not so good thing is the researchers are not sitting in the same room and are creative on a whiteboard and coming up with good solutions. So for us, basically, as, as corporate leaders, we have to figure out what do we do with our labor force and how do we get the best out of productivity and creativity of our people in the new world. And I, I firmly believe that we will not go back into the time of pre-pandemic. And I have to say for myself, I was traveling probably 100 day, 110 days a year to foreign countries. I think I can do it with half of it, not missing missing a lot. And I think that will not come back, which has a massive impact on, on the airline industry, obviously. Uh, Hank, I want to get your general view on what, what changes if I may, Hank, but I particularly want to ask, given your background in pharmaceuticals, um, you know, the one of the things we can pretty well guarantee sadly and tragically, is that there will be more pandemics. We these, these are very regular occurrences, not perhaps obviously as dramatically and as seriously as we've had for the last over the last couple of years. But if you go back through history, these happen a lot. Are we is this going to be a will this serve at least as a wake up call so that we'll be better prepared for the next one? Well, it's hard to say that for 35 years now, I've been warning people that we've had one global pandemic every hundred years and we were overdue. Uh, I can't say that anymore. Hopefully this one will soon be behind us. Uh, Short term, I think we're facing a number of difficult transitions. So I think the short term is going to be very difficult. But I agree with Andreas that the transition is going to be to a much better place. You know, let's face it, economies grow at night while the government sleeps. Uh, Ukraine, I think, is 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 a wonderful example of 
free people valuing freedom, want to, wanting to take their own future into their own hands, that has to be enormously positive for the economy. The thing I'm hearing in conversations with numerous CEOs when I ask, how do you think uh, the new way of working has affected productivity? Uh, the answer is always a variation on the same theme, which is 25% are working more effectively and more productively than ever. That's Andreas. He's in that bucket with his international travel. 50% are doing just as well, and we probably don't need the 25%. Right. Well, I think there is an opportunity here for enormous economic growth and opportunity once we get through this transition. Marco, if I may ask you, um, one of the things that I think everybody agrees is probably going to be an um, implication of the, of the pandemic is companies have looked to um, secure their supply chains much more. We've seen, obviously, supply chain disruption on an enormous scale. Um, and a lot of reshoring is going on, um, a lot of deglobalization, I think, uh, is how you know a lot of people think of it as, as companies, as we become, e all of us become a little more concerned about supply chains. How, how do you see that, again, for, for, from Mexico? And uh, how, how concerned are you as a, an economy, which is obviously a, ma a major economy in, in, in the global economy and plays an important role, if we are becoming more, if you like, more insular and, 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 and deglobalization is a reality, how much of a concern is that for you? Well, it, it, uh, it represents an opportunity to, to Mexico in terms of, of uh, as, as you were saying, this uh, reshoring, this, near, this nearshoring, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to redefine the, the way the public policies for, for uh, investing and promotion of the, of the country in terms of how can we develop new suppliers we have a, a, a vast amount of smes small and medium enterprises which are willing to compete in in in, in these big markets such as united states and canada and, and with europe and because of, of the of, of uh, this uh, conflict between us and, and and china mexico could take profit of this of this uh, situation in terms of developing uh, substitute uh, new new suppliers and including the, them on this on this uh, new new uh, ch uh, value value uh, global distribution chains so so i think it, for for Querétaro it itself it's it's uh, an opportunity of, of uh, generating new uh, opportunities for investing for uh, investing from abroad but just but, but also from uh, uh, generating a, a productive uh, project for Querétaro for Mexico that can uh, uh, substitute import, uh, imports from from other 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 countries. And Jane, I'm going to give you uh, the last word. Um, your thoughts on um, you know what what the last two years has done to change the way the world works for for the, for, the, for you know for the long term. Well, I think the big piece that has become very apparent is that we need our skilled workers. We need our skilled healthcare workers. We need skilled workers to, uh, to, that's where the new jobs are going to come from. You know, for too many decades, we focused on this idea of you either had a high school diploma and then you went and got an hourly wage job or you went to college, you went to university and got a degree. And we've missed this missing middle, the middle path that was always there with skill set training. And I really think we've taken our eye off the ball with it. We need to get back in focus with that. We have 20 million skilled worker jobs open in the U.S. alone. And as I said earlier, when we see the impact of COVID, people not going back to work in the office, people wanting to start their own business, we are going to have to relook at education. And the piece of education that we have missed is our skilled workforce. And yes, some will be replaced by robots and AI, but a great many of them will not be. And we need to look and see where our education is heading. A four-year degree, a four-year a PhD isn't going to get those roads built, those bridges built, and people taken care of in hospitals. And so I believe we've got to rethink all the big opportunities ahead. Jane, thank you very much indeed. That was indeed the last word. We're out of time. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to Jane, Hank, um, and uh, Andreas, and Marco, thank you for that really fascinating discussion. And again, I just want to end as I started saying, um, you know, our conversation um, uh, has been inevitably overshadowed by the human tragedy taking place in Ukraine, and our hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to those people. Uh, and we hope that somehow a resolution can be brought to it uh, as soon as possible. But in the meantime, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for joining this Horasis plenary session. Thanks to you all. And look forward to the next one. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye.
Thank you.